We are talking, of course, about sport as a vehicle for social responsibility. Uh, and I would like, during the course of this hour, to, to look at a couple of different avenues where sport engages with society. One, of course, is just to make a, a proactive impact on a community, but then also in reacting to the issues of the times. Uh, but I'd like to start with, first of all, obviously sport is capable of doing extraordinary things in society. But the first question I have, and Mr. Papandrea, I'd like to start with you, is does sport, whether it's a league, federation, uh, or a sponsor, actually have a responsibility to anything except its own well-being? Does it have an actual social responsibility? Well, I'm honored to be here, and uh, thank you very much. Um, I was listening to the previous panel, and it was uh, fascinating about soccer and, 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 and politics and so on. Um, and I, I want to go back just for w one moment to um, the ancient concept of, of, of sport. We're talking about the Olympics, we're talking about games. And what happened in, in Athens and other cities at that time is that all of a sudden politics was a, basically a revelation, a wider, I'm talking about the wider concept of politics, because we usually define politics as very, very narrow, uh, a revelation that all of a sudden people said, well, you know, actually we don't have to uh, accept our fate. We don't have to have tyrants. We don't have to have these uh, high priests telling us what to do. We can actually change our societies. Uh, we can take our own fate in our own hands. But when you say that, and that's a revelation, that is a real revelation, that we can actually change the world, then what do you say? What's the consequence is that second, uh, sort of immediately after that, is that you say, well, if we can do that, then we have to invest in our potential as human beings. Let's create all the capacities so that we can actually be good human beings, um, capable of making good choices and changing the world. So that's when they started saying, OK, well, then let's invest in arts, let's invest in culture, theater, and let's invest in sport. Sport was actually to develop the potential of society, of human beings, so that they could be better citizens. They could, be, uh, they could, they could really see, realize the potential. So it was very much linked, even from the ancient times, to a sense of social responsibility of becoming trained so that you can be a good citizen. And of course, the Olympic Games um, uh, linked this with not only potential, but it was a sense of uh, a common language. There was a common culture. Uh, we all accept certain rules and values that, that bring us together. Uh, it was a competition. Um, a peaceful competition. It wasn't a competition to kill each other. It wasn't a competition of emperors or, 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 or kings watching for their entertainment. It was to really highlight the potential that any human being <laughs> has the potential. Uh, and I think that's very important at a time when we're talking about refugees, when we're talking about Paralympics, when we're talking about any human being, whatever, whoever background has this potential. And finally, the idea that sports and this festival of, of culture <laughs> was even a higher value than, uh, than a conflict, than, than wars. They stopped wars. It was a, this was a truce. <laughs> the truce agreement, which actually existed, was the longest in humankind, 1,200 years. Uh, it, was, it was kept every four years. Uh, and that was the opportunity to, um, to, make, uh, to, to make peace agreements and to, to come together. That is the kind of thing I think we have to see how we translate that in today's world. And there are capacities, and this Truce Foundation that I'm vice president of, we try to see how in the, in we can bring this back, this whole idea of bringing back, um, using the, the symbolism, the strength of sport in the Olympic movement to <coughs> inspire in conflict areas the possibility of a truce even for a few days, which might then be extended to a much longer period of time. Lady Grace Thompson, <coughs> uh, at some point people also figured out besides all those values, whether political or social, sports were also potential for pretty big business <laughs> as well, uh, which defines the, the, the modern sport world. Uh, in a modern context, what is sports responsibility to society? Um, I think sport has a huge responsibility to society, but that's changed a lot in even the last five or 10 years. You know, when, when I was six and had to start using a wheelchair, I wanted to be an athlete because I wanted to compete. I wanted to be everyone in my area, then everyone in Britain, then everyone in the world. 
and then through my time competing, recognised the, the power that sport has to influence and change because people still treat me very differently if they recognise me um, as either a parliamentarian or an ex-athlete or I'm just that random woman in a wheelchair. So it's, it's very interesting how sport is used. But I, I was part of the bid process for the London 2012 Olympics and Paralympics. You know, um, rightly or wrongly, we chose to use the word legacy. Um, and then, you know, we expect sport to change everything. We expected 10 days of the Paralympics to change the whole world's attitude towards disabled people. We expected two weeks of the Olympics to make everyone feel nice and positive to each other. Um, and I think that's hard because everyone has a different view of what sport can deliver and what it can bring. But it is business. I think we have to be really honest about sport and it is a business. You know, Manchester United Football Club is a business. It is there to make money. Does it care about the results? Well, yes, because that affects business. Does it care about disabled spectators? Not particularly, because they don't allow disabled people to particularly go and watch. So I, I think we just have to be very realistic. It can be lots of things to lots of people, but, but at heart, and I think it sh we shouldn't be afraid of it being a business, because actually the money it makes can do a huge amount of good things. We just have to be really clear what we expect from it. Edwin, so often when there are issues in society that cross into sport, sport is reacting to it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it has led the way in certain places. Um, Major League Baseball was integrated before uh, a lot of areas of American society were. But that was a business decision, a recognition that here were athletes who could make this game better. You had general managers and owners saying, I need those athletes. Is the market enough to drive that change? And if it is not, how do you get people who are in a business to make a decision that is an ethical and moral decision, not necessarily a business one? Well, I think um, just based on what uh, Mr. Pompadour and, and Tani have talked about, it started with the ethos of sports uh, as it started in Greece and what it meant to society. And then Tani followed up and talking about the fact that it is a business. And uh, I think sport, there is a, um, uh, sport means a lot to many, many people around the world. And uh, the way I look at it is that there's four universal languages. There's music, love, art, and sports. Those are four things that happen to people and four things that people really feel passionate about no matter where they are. Now, if you talk about uh, sport being a business today, um, it's a much different endeavor um, from the marketing point of view and also from the athlete's point of view than it was when I was competing. When I was growing up, uh, for American football fans, when you looked at a guy like a Bill Russell or a Jim Brown or uh, a Joe Namath, who was you know, one of the first heavily marketed uh, athletes, one of the things that they exuded during that time was uh, integrity and confidence. And you had a, a, a league of players, whether it was baseball, football, in general, they meant a lot to people on, on a very personal level. And people were able to relate to them on a very personal level and, and rely on them to be role models. Today, it's uh, dramatically different. Um, there are people, corporations, athletes, people in and around the world of sport who look at it strictly <laughs> as a, as a uh, financial uh, endeavor, and that's really changed what really what sports really means from from every perspective, from the governance perspective, from the uh, players' pers perspective on the field, uh, from the corporate perspective, the league perspective, the marketers. It's completely different than it was 20 years ago and uh, 50 years ago. You would not recognize sports based on the way that it was conducted then, whether it's in in, in uh, the English Football League or here in the United States. Nels, you've worked, uh, uh, prior to your work with the Special Olympics, of course, you were with UNICEF, did a great deal of work in the Sudan. Internationally speaking, where have you seen sports have an impact that you would say would be positive? Well, I think uh, Special Olympics is a fantastic example of how one of the largest groups of discriminated people around the world, about 200 million, with some say intellectual disabilities, I prefer the term a special ability to love and to express joy and so on. Uh, sports helps them come out of the houses. 
you very seldom see them out because they are <coughs> hidden away in rooms. And in the Western world, we also discriminate because sometimes because we don't understand them and love them and care and spend time, time with them, we prefer to give them a pill so that they calm down when they are having an absolutely normal reaction to an abnormal situation of carelessness. And sport brings joy. And the unified sports that now uh, Special Olympics is promoting is helping us rediscover what the real joy of sport should be. When you play in a unified team where you mix both the typical persons and persons with special abilities, you experience the sport in a completely different way. And you rediscover what real joy is. And we need to bring that forward and obviously <coughs> incorporate social responsibility. Sometimes you have to take decisions based on economics uh, for you to be able to buy, be viable. But there are certain things where you would like to be recognized as an enterprise, whether it's Procter & Gamble, whether it is ESPN or Coke or whatever, who have been sponsoring, for instance, Special Olympics for the long haul, not because it gives them great publicity, but because it's a question of changing public perceptions, changing public policies, ending discrimination, just like we have fought against discrimination against gender or race or whatever. These are barriers that we need to be part of breaking. And sport is a wonderful conduit to bring out that joy and to bring down the barriers of discrimination. The, the potential is certainly there. And we've seen it in certain areas. But let, let's talk about the areas like the NFL, FIFA, uh, multi-billion dollar operations that, of course, have efforts that include outreach and development. Um, what would you say, and again, I just want to come back to this, is this issue of what we should expect from them. There is some outreach. Uh, but when you are of that size, what kind of, and I'd like to ask you, mm -hmm. what should they be doing <coughs> in the community? What aren't they doing? I know that FIFA does have projects, and I've been to uh, uh, one of their big ones in Cameroon where they built a football uh, uh, community with pools and football and so forth. So they do a lot. Of, a lot. I'm not really in tune with everything that they do. Um, I know that our organization, Laureus, operates in a completely different way. We deal with um, not any particular sport, and we're not uh, trying to develop sports stars. So um, as you mentioned, we, we are an organization that really tries to make a difference in people's lives. So um, professional leagues that have charitable and philanthropic arms, they operate in a completely different way to really service the needs of the, of the league. Um, and in addition, they also service the needs of the communities that, that, that they are, which are limited because they're only dealing with football or you're only dealing with basketball. So we at Laureus, we deal with, we deal with issues not sports. We don't build arenas. We don't build volleyball courts. We don't build uh, tracks or anything. We deal with the kids and we <laughs> use sport as an accumulator because we know we can get kids together if we have sporting events. So our approach is completely different. Lady Grey Thompson, you? Um, yeah. I, I think big sports can do a huge amount, something like soccer. Um, uh, it's football association at home. I have continued discussions with them saying, they could be the sport that radically change how girls and women play and officiate and are included in society. And sports development is really hard because if it was easy, the big governing bodies would have done it years ago and the national federations would have, have done it years ago. But I do think they have uh, a responsibility to invest equitably and to look at how they can change society. And it's about the rules. You know, when you have in, in the UK, girls drop out of physical activity. We used to think it was the age of 13. We now know they start disengaging at eight because of the media, because of the portrayal, because there's an obsession with being a size zero that we value sporty boys, we don't value sporty girls. If you're a sporty girl in school, then you're normally called a whole pile of fairly rude names and your sexuality is, is brought into question. So there's all these things that, that sport can transcend. But it needs the right people at the right levels in the organisation to, to see that potential. And money does make a huge difference. 
but I think how it's spent. And, and I think sometimes some of the big organisations can spend less money and do more, but it's just be really smart how, how they spend it. You know, where, where sports have rules that stop girls participating, it's, it's very short-sighted. You know, we, we know in the UK, 80% of women are not fit enough to be healthy. So this is not just about elite sport. This is about society not being fit and healthy and strong enough to survive and to compete on a, a world stage. So for me, it, it goes beyond sport. It goes to physical activity. It goes to much, much wider areas. But, but sport is the, the thing that drives it, and competitive sport drives it. What, whose responsibility is it, though, to make that happen? Well, it'd be lovely if all the federations thought it was their responsibility to make it happen. The reality is some, some will be better than others. I do think you know, some of the sponsors have a responsibility. Um, you know, they're putting in a lot of money every year. They should be guiding. You know, it's, as Edwin said, it's about you know, ethical status. It's about um, you know, how they want to be perceived. Global brands want to be perceived uh, in a good way. If they're linking themselves to sports, which are corrupt, that's a struggle. Um, uh, the announcement today that the IAAF, has, uh, International Athletics Federation, has been raided uh, by French police. I'm like, great, this is good, because actually, Seb Coe is the new president of IAAF, can't sort it out all on his own. He needs a legal weight behind him to make that happen. And unfortunately, if that has to be governments and police and, and the legal side, it's good, be because the public are not stupid. They will only tolerate some of this for so long. What they want to see is they want to see clean, good sporting competition. People are still supporting those sports, but they won't be forever if they think it's been run in a bad way. You, you bring up a terrific point in the news about the IAAF and also the scandals that we've seen with FIFA, the NFL's dealing with domestic violence, other sports with similar issues. The, the recurring theme with this is that they're always reacting to a crisis. And then it's a question of, do the sponsors get involved? The, the pressure usually seems to come from sponsors or from government. Uh, Mr. Papandreou, having worked in sport and government, uh, can you change that dynamic so that sport acts proactively on some of these, not reactively? Uh, and how does, you know, does government have a responsibility for that? How, who could be the impetus to, to make that shift? I believe that this is a, obviously a wider issue of um, the fact that we see uh, uh, concentration uh, of wealth, uh, not only in sport but in other areas, and that has led to, um, to uh, uh, inequalities and corruption in many parts of our societies. But sport uh, in, in particular uh, uh, has, we've seen uh, you know, recently both globally but also I've, I've seen it domestically even in, in Greece how very often um, sport can be captured by, by special interests. Uh, you have, I think, then the need for sponsors. You have the need for the fans, the citizens that, are, that, that actually do want to see sport as uh, something that inspires. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and they, have, they have a voice. The more we give them a voice, the better. And the more we give them the voice, the more the politicians will also um, be res more responsive and accountable to those voices. And then you obviously need, sort of a, I would say, a coalition of different parts of society. So you need government, you need politics, you need uh, the, the rules and regulations, you need the sponsors and the, and the uh, different uh, organizations, sport organizations, and you need the public education working together to see how sports can actually work and, and deal with some of these issues. Some of them are, are, are highly important, linking it with health issues, linking it with issues of marginalized citizens, whether they be refugees, whether they be... Uh, uh, you know, Paralympics, uh, people with special abilities uh, or whatever, uh, different ethnic groups and so on. This are, these are very important issues. And sport can and has been in different parts of the world a catalyst. I, I was visiting uh, only recently a, a refugee camp in Jordan and um, I met some kids and they were saying to me, uh, young kids, adolescents, they were saying, we left our home, we don't know where we are, we don't know where we're going. And then I visited um, uh, uh, one of these sort of small um, um, uh, project, which was basically a sport project, and you saw those ki same kids, the same generation, how they were saying to me, well, you know, we were out there fighting with each other, we didn't have much to do, we didn't know where we were going, now we're doing, you know, Greco-Roman wrestling, we're doing soccer, we're doing all kinds of things, 
we feel we're empowered, we feel we can be self-disciplined, we have hope. So it, it really it depends. If we can work together, we can really make sport, uh, and, and as it would, should be and has, and has been, uh, really a, a catalyst for, for a better society. Now, sports can also be an important instrument for violence reduction. In some of the most violent favelas of Rio de Janeiro, you have uh, uh, <coughs> some of the sp soccer players who have themselves come out of those areas. In part of transforming that community and reducing the levels of violence, because they engage the young people in, in soccer. Another aspect where, where sport has to be watchful is the fact that so many young children are involved. And where young children and older interact, there has to be the watch in terms of social protection from sexual abuse. And particularly for Special Olympics, persons with special abilities are exposed four to five times more than typical children and youth. So we need to be particularly careful to make sure that no such instances take place. But yes, sports is a wonderful uh, tool for transformation. And any enterprise that wants to invest in something that they will be remembered 20 years from now as having been part of that change, they, <coughs> should use, they could use sports. But they need to find precisely the vehicles mm. that are ethical and that are committed to social change in a positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have ex ex extensive experience of working with corporations, sponsors, uh, what is the difference between, a, 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 in your experience, a corporation that is in it because I just, we just want to have our brand associated with this thing that makes people feel good, and those who are looking to be some sort of agent for change? You know, every year, uh, and I know you see it too, and Tani, we've talked about this before, every year, probably three, four times a year, you have lots of celebrities that go to places where there's severe problems. They show up, spend two or three days, you see it on BBC, CNN, and so forth. And uh, our organization, we work with, with issues that affect kids, just as you were speaking of. Uh, we've done projects in Sierra Leone to rehabilitate boy soldiers who have arms hacked off, who are forced to kill people under these warlords, and so we deal with those kind of issues. Kids with orphans, orphaned from, uh, during the World Cup in 2006, uh, we dealt with, we took 275 kids to a practice game with the U.S. Soccer Federation playing, I forget who, but that was their World Cup. They would have never had anything to do with it, probably would have seen a couple of games on TV, but we took 275 kids that had no parents to a game. And so we deal, with, we deal with issues that are, are very dramatic and are going to be life-changing issues for kids around the world. And we don't care. I mean, we use horseback riding, sailing, soccer, cricket. We don't care about the sport, and we don't care whether the kids learn a sport or become world class. All we want to do is use the sport to accumulate them, surround them with people who can help uh, assist with the problem, our project managers that deal specifically with the pro problem. And, and move on. In fact, we have um, one of our project leaders uh, sitting right here, Anna Reyes, who runs a wonderful project uh, up in the Bronx that uh, physical fitness, obesity, um, kids that may have emotional issues, or parents that, that, uh, uh, that are not educated, that are working day and night, and the kids are home during the day. And she takes these kids and puts them on bicycles, and at the end of the, um, uh, their training and, and uh, social skills, assessments, and whatnot, they ride 100 miles. And so we do things that are going to help kids to take them out of their scenarios and give them a better opportunity to be more productive citizens. And we find that in many cases, a lot of these kids that, that grow up in our projects actually become project leaders, end up going to college and universities, and um, go back and, and learn how to be project managers in their countries and continue to make a, a contribution. So we're trying to build a legacy and something for um, uh, a project in Namibia, for example, or South Africa, to give them something to build on that's going to help their society long after you know, we've finished funding them. And, uh, 
and, and sometimes longer. Uh, I mean, we've had kids six years old who are now project leaders. So we try to build a changing environment and give people an opportunity to change their, their uh, predicament. And what can you do, though, to get corporate sponsors to recognize that and, and help with those activities? You, you mentioned some that you feel have been committed to this mm -hmm. beyond a simple public relations mm -hmm. gesture. What do you do to get more of that from these larger sports federations and their sponsors? I think the sponsors want to understand that anecdotally you can say sports is going to make a change and if you have kids playing sports you can take good pictures and put it on a flyer and, and do promotion but I think they want to know exactly what the outcomes are going to be and what the expectations are for these different projects and, and, and have measurables that they can rely on. And uh, we do that through, at Lawyers, through measurement and evaluation. We develop a software package that we use to analyze and then present uh, documentation to potential sponsors and say, we have these projects. This is what the intent is, and this is, these are what the results are. So we try to get them engaged <coughs> at that level. And then try to get them to, um, and our sponsors are fantastic because they have the resources and the marketing and the PR and the reach to really promote what we're doing in the proper way and not just use it for advertising and marketing. Um, I think that the sports federations, their job is to put butts in the seats. Their job is, I don't think that most of them are professionally, professionally capable enough to have enough people in the office that know about development to really uh, make a long lasting imp impact. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for them and that's not their business. Well, that's kind of a core issue there. Like you said, it's, it's not their, their core business. Uh, but that really is the best source uh, available to, su to support those efforts. Yeah, I know you would like to see them give the money to you and let you do with it. We would like that as well. It would be, I think, a lot more efficient mm -hmm. for almost all of the major organizations to have organizations that do nothing but um, put their feet on the ground, send teams out into no man's land, evaluate projects, help build projects, help build the project leaders, the infrastructure, and make it work. There are many corporations that are still in their infancy when mm -hmm. it comes to corporate social responsibility. They are focusing on very local, mm -hmm. what you could call acts of charity. That's very respectful uh, and, and very good. Uh, but assuming responsibility for changing a situation or changing an issue that requires greater engagement. But taking on a huge challenge, changing the world, the Rotarians took on the issue of trying to exterminate uh, polio, for instance, mm -hmm. and worked year after year at collecting resources to achieve that. When you take on a major issue like that, or discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, like we have been talking about, that requires a different level of corporate engagement and we don't have many corporations that have reached that level. Mm -hmm. Lady Tani, call me, it's Tani, it's much okay. easier, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Easier for me too. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I think where we've seen the Paralympic movement change in um, you know the last 30 years has been amazing because you know early on some companies gave money to the Paralympic movement because it made them feel warm and happy and wasn't it lovely and they they felt that they were helping these poor people and you know these um, and, you know, in my early years of competing, the question I was most frequently asked is, well, do you train? Yeah, 15 times a week, 50 weeks a year. Yeah, we do train. Um, but the, the companies who've been most successful at partnering with the Paralympic movement are, are the ones that embrace the values of the Paralympic movement, mm -hmm. um, but then also have similar values within their company. Um, and so, f you know, some of the best things we've seen is, is actually just showing disabled people as athletes. Um, and, you know, Olympians and Paralympians, they're not the norm. You know, they're a tiny percentage of the population. People who have the physical attributes and the desire to win and the ability to train really hard and to have no social life and, to, you know, to do all these things. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Um, and that's what we want, really, is, is Olympians and Paralympians. That, that's okay to portray them in, in that way. So the, the best ones we've seen are the ones who just say, okay, you, you may not have a leg, you may be a wheelchair user, but actually that doesn't stop you doing things. Um, we, one of our Paralympians who competed in London, Martine Wright, she was injured in the 7-7 bombings. She lost both her legs. She lost 80% of her blood. Um, and she, um, by 
complete fluke, you know, came through and competed at, at, at the Paralympics in 2012. She sends a, a massively strong message about integration, about what you can do, not about all the things you can't do. Every single person in this room is not brilliant at everything. You know, I'm not great at going upstairs, but you know, there's other things I'm good at. And I think if we, we can move away from all the things you can't do to, to be more positive, and, and the companies that get that, Will, will be transformational for them as businesses as well as for transforming the Paralympic movement. I, say that I think most people probably don't know that para in Paralympics came from parallel uh, you know, originally, and all those elements that you showed, it's the same training, it's the same commitment, but, but through, uh, as, a, as that movement has expanded, have you seen an impact in how the, the greater public uh, whether it's in the UK or, or around the world, does look at people with disability. Yeah, I mean, if you look back to the 1980 Games, the Soviet Union refused to have a Paralympics because they said they didn't have any disabled people. They had lots, they were just very, very integrated into society in a way that wasn't happening in other countries around the world. You look at China, who, who only really started taking the Paralympics seriously uh, around 2000, in 2004, they only selected a team of athletes from the greater Beijing area. Um, there's about 30 million disabled people in China, which is quite scary for any other country in terms of talent ID. But, you know, from 2004, they've topped the medal table. We've just had the World Athletics Championships in Doha. Uh, they took 79 athletes. They got more gold medals than the next two countries on the league table. So has it changed the attitude towards disabled people in the whole of China? No. Um, you know, the first time I went there in 2005, people stopped me in the street and poked me. And, you know, excuse me, this is, but came up and sort of doing that to Are me. you real? Yeah, you're real. And because they'd never seen a disabled person. So it, it, it's changing. It's just, it's slowly. And, and for Paralympic movement, you know, it's not that well known in the USA. Once we crack the USA market, once we have a product that will be shown live on, on American television, then you know that 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 changes a whole pile of things around the world. Um, we don't have as many countries competing in the Paralympics as the Olympics. We're getting there because actually no country or a country that has no social program for disabled people probably won't have a Paralympic team. But if they see the how important it is to have a Paralympic team, social programs come behind that. So it's it's a bit of a chicken and egg. They they sort of work together, and and there has been an impact on disabled people. It won't change every disabled person's life. But, but it's changing many millions. It's a good place to, to pivot. You, we talked about, mentioned a couple of key issues here. One, countries and their human rights records. <laughs> and we, this came up with the Olympics, and it's coming up again with the World Cup in Russia, Russia's laws about homosexuality. What responsibility does the IOC or FIFA or any international organization have to take a country's human rights record into account? Well, let me give a wider picture, I think this is a very, very hot issue, and, and uh, I, I personally have always fought for human rights in, in, in politics in my life. Uh, a little bit of what we're trying to do in the, in the Truce Foundation uh, and how we link it with, with, um, with the IOC, we, we are part of the IOC, uh, of the uh, International Olympic um, Movement. Uh, the idea, we have been able to, um, at certain points, have a truce. For example, in Sarajevo during the uh, war in Yugoslavia uh, was the, Lill the Lillehammer Games. There was one day of truce where uh, kids were inoculated uh, on both sides, on all sides actually, um, by uh, UNICEF. Uh, in uh, Nagano, uh, President Clinton decided to stave off bombing Iraq and Kofi Annan went and actually had a deal with Saddam Hussein then. Uh, in Sydney, um, the two Koreas marched with, under the banner of the uh, Olympic um, a flag uh, and, uh, and, they're f and together. Uh, we, uh, we hope to do similar things in the, uh, in the Rio uh, game. We're working now with the um, Colombian uh, President uh, Santos, Dos Santos, uh, Mr. Santos, because of the conflict there. Um, and, but, but, and, and when I was foreign minister, I, I signed the Olympic truce uh, with my counterpart from Turkey. And then we both went around asking people to sign this. So we had Nelson Mandela, we had Yasser Arafat and Simon Peres sign it, Bill Clinton, leaders around the world. But in the end, it's also a lot of grassroots work, which you, you have been doing in the, in the Paralympic movement, also, Edwin, what you're doing is uh, hands-on. And um, I, I, 
For example, now we have this, this conflict in Syria and in the wider Middle East and the huge question of, of refugees. What has been decided by the IOC is, is I think, very unique uh, and it's very interesting. It's saying we will allow for refugees to compete in the Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro. That is, they will not come as uh, a nation, and they won't, only, they, won't be, they won't be Syrians, they'll be from other parts of the world too. They won't come re representing their nation, they'll be representing themselves as a refugee, which is basically elevating uh, a concept to what, what you said, Edwin, is this trying to create a language, a communication, a common language around the world, uh, a global citizenship, a sense that we share common values. Now, how do you infuse that in countries with, uh, which have you know, less democratic or uh, less um, uh, transparent uh, governance uh, or they, they, certain minorities uh, are, are excluded? Well, the IOC obviously is not the UN, so it can't impose uh, issues. But what it can do is create at the grassroots level a culture of a new way of looking at things, as uh, Baroness, you were saying, the the um, you can't, you may not change the whole attitude of society for, towards people with disabilities, but you start changing it. It's, it's sort of a grassroots building up from the bottom, and I think this is what uh, we we can see sports in in that direction moving to say, okay, if oh, since Beijing gets the the Olympics, well, uh, one hopes that that will be a a, a sort of Take a number of make a number of uh, of symbolic types of things, whether it's the Paralympics or whether it's just the fact the opening up to the world, which will then influence over time society towards uh, a, a much more open and much much better and much more inclusive society. So that I think is where the role of the Olympic movement and sports can be. Very difficult to think of it as top down, uh, you know, imposing. I mean, with the UN itself can't make these changes in these countries. So, it, but it is very, very important that we are creating a public opinion, a global public opinion. And one more, just one more point before I, I, I finish on this: um, the types of challenges we are facing as the human race today uh, have never been 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 in front of us before. Whether it's climate change, whether it's these massive refugees, whether it's uh, this globalization, the speed of technology, and so on, we are so interdependent that we need a culture of cooperation. And luckily, what we're seeing in many parts of the world is people hunkering down, moving back into their tribal uh, knee-jerk reactions. You know, the nationalism, the, uh, the, the fundamentalism, the religious, uh, let's, let's, let's hide behind walls again. Let's create new walls and new barriers. Well, what sports actually does is it breaks down those barriers. And it's creating a common language around the world, which is absolutely necessary if we want to be able to manage our planet uh, in, in a positive way. <coughs> Edwin, uh, the IOC, it, its job is to organize Olympic Games, but it, it gets an extraordinary amount of public money. It is tied in with government, every country it's involved in. Does it have a responsibility to take more of a top-down role for issues like human rights uh, than, it, than it currently does? I think, I think it tries. I think some of the issues come to the table unexpectedly. There's so many issues that can come up. I mean, when you have an Olympic bid, I think they award the game six years ahead of time. You can predict the type of articles and the type of controversies that's gonna that are going to come up. There's going to be over land use. There's going to be water. There's going to be pollution. There's going to be human rights, workers. Um, there's about seven or ten different, probably can, topics that are going to hit the papers. And then there's a, you know, a few other things, for example, in Brazil the issue of the uh, politics of the favelas. Um, uh, in Russia, it was the, the, the gay uh, controversy. So you're going to have these issues that come up. And some of them are more unpredictable. And the IOC can do what it, what it wants. And as you said, create an atmosphere such that these issues can be uh, dealt with and, 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 and people walk away feeling that, uh, hopefully, that the IOC has been a peacemaker and able to to get people to the table and, and, and make a situation better. But it's completely unpredictable. And uh, top down, I don't think the IRC or anyone can do it. There's just too many issues. I mean, if you had uh, uh, the issue of women uh, participating in sports, for example, in uh, certain countries in the Middle East, or the type of garb that um, traditionally will be worn 
uh, on a mandatory basis at a sporting event versus what's going to happen at the Olympic Games. It's unpredictable what's going to happen. And uh, I don't know if any one agency can solve these problems, but the IOC can certainly be a, a mediator and, and, and begin the process of trying to entice people to, to make a change and to make, make a change that's reasonable and workable. Tony, have you seen evidence that simple engagement can affect social change? Mr. Papandre would mention, you know, for example, uh, just it's an old economic argument. Just simply open the markets, we will influence each other. Um, but have you seen evidence in the sports movement that the Olympics uh, or, or the World Cup or anybody else really did have a change on a human rights issue in another country? Um, sometimes you just don't see it that, that quickly. I mean, I've definitely seen it within the Paralympic movement that there has been many positive changes. But um, in terms of, you know, can the federations or should they be making better judgments about where events go to? Yeah, I think they should. But also, if the Paralympics hadn't have been in China, it wouldn't have given us any opportunity to go there and talk about things like disabled women aren't, they aren't allowed to get married, that actually if you're disabled, you're not allowed to drive. So it gives us an opportunity to, to kind of shine a spotlight and have some of those discussions. Um, you know, I've seen um, through, um, I went to Rwanda with, with the Laureus Foundation, and you see there um, a huge number of young boys who are leg like amputees, girls who are HIV AIDS, um, and how sport has been able to change that. You know, 10, 15 years ago, Rwanda would never have thought of having a Paralympic team. They, they weren't even in a position to do it. Um, now, being able to have a team and, and take them there, that's then changed it, it, it back at a, a local level. But the one thing that I think I feel more comforted about within the whole FIFA and all the stuff that's happening is it's less and less possible for these big international federations to make decisions in isolation mm. without being questioned. 20 years ago, none of them were questioned. It was just, oh, that's what, that's what they do, that's how they behave. It's actually a responsibility of us all to shine a spotlight on those federations, say, what are you doing? Do you, do you have women representative, representation? You know, ju just be able to go back to them and say, this is not good enough, we expect more from you because it's sport. I agree also, you know, in China, only two decades ago, we had no special Olympics mm. uh, athletes. Yeah. Now we have over 900,000. And in many places around the world, Russia the same. You know? So that helps contribute to start changing the attitude. But there's a long way. I mean, there's no country that isn't breaking human rights when it comes to persons with special abilities. So we have a huge challenge in giving them a voice and in creating a platform for them to have a voice. And one, of, one of the things yeah. that the Paralympics has really contributed to society is that um, we have a lot of people coming back and living in areas where there's war injuries. Mm -hmm. And the integration, the way that they're rehabilitated, the integration back into society, whether it's a brain issue, uh, injury or a physical injury, that has been, uh, that has created a, a, a real possibilities of life for people who with those type of injuries and disabilities would have been uh, just pushed into the side. We, we did a project with Special Olympics in China in 2004 or three, I think, uh, with all-star group of people, Nadia Komanich, myself, Nawal El Mutawakel, Daley Thompson, and uh, we learned a lot from that trip. It was one of our first big international trips. And, and, and we know that it made a difference from following Absolutely. up with the Special Olympics and bringing those kids um, out of the villages or wherever the, you know, the, that they were harbored and uh, making the government aware that you have, to do, you have to do better than this and it worked over there. Yeah. It's worked. Can I just add to that? I, I mean, this, this is great work which you all are doing on, on at, at grassroots and I think that's, that's important and I think that highlights something I've been in foreign policy for many years of my life as foreign minister, and um, I've seen there are two approaches, and some, sometimes both work. One is the top-down, which, which you mentioned, uh, with basically imposing certain rules. Uh, some of the countries we're talking about are very, very sensitive to outside, a sense of outside intervention. Uh, and what will happen is that they will actually react more negatively when you try to impose. Uh, however, through sport, 
you actually can get a message to them and to the societies and create public opinion, which can be uh, a much more um, subtle, I would, subtle, subtle, <laughs> subtle, and 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 also respectful, maybe, of their culture and their. Uh, but say there is another way, and you know, actually, you know, maybe women actually, if you, they really want to win, the t if the team wants to win, they, maybe they shouldn't wear all this garb, which is a little put this heavy for them, uh, or you know, or you know, people in, in Paralympics or in Special Olympics. They actually can contribute to society, you know? so you're giving a very strong message, which uh, has a longer-term effect. Now, of course, it will depend on the leadership of these countries whether they take that message and run with it and use it. And sometimes they won't, but sometimes they will. Uh, but in any case, I think that's a different approach. I'm saying both approaches can work, but uh, sports, I think, the way it will work more effectively is, as you said, the subtle approach. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I mean, <coughs> excuse me. A number of the successes that each of you has mentioned have come from grassroots, uh, bottom-up efforts. The Paralympic movement was successful, has been successful, not because someone on high decreed it shall be, uh, but because of the number of people who were involved and the support that they managed to get along the way. Uh, and we talked before about how economics simply, well, I mean, l let's look at integration in this country. You know, college football was integrated because all white teams were getting their, brain, their brains beaten in when they did play teams that were integrated or mostly African-American. Major League Baseball integrated when you could not deny the, the quality of baseball that was being played in the Negro Leagues. Uh, but those were reacting to forces mm -hmm. as opposed to conscious movements. Um, looking forward at what sports has the potential to do, what would you change about the current model, if anything, or do we simply need to let the efforts that are in place do their jobs, run their course, and hope that, that time takes care of that? Or is there something structurally you can do through the role of government, through the role of, of sponsors, uh, that could somehow be a greater catalyst? And those are well, the start with <coughs> Certainly, I think uh, it needs to be, I mean, one of the rights, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child establishes the right to sport. And if you go into these larger and larger slum areas around the world, they don't have a playing field. Mm. They don't, it's not lit up at night. Mm. Uh, there's no way that they can really play sports. Uh, I've been working in Sudan and many places. Th there simply aren't places where they can do sports. So we need to certainly try to change that because once you create those opportunities, uh, you also create the opportunity for change. What will they otherwise be doing between six o'clock in the afternoon and 10 o'clock in the evening? You're just giving the opportunity for criminality and violence mm -hmm. to continue growing instead of the positive uh, forces that sports can create. So how do you make that happen? How do you, I mean, you, you do your work, uh, your foundation does its work. There are so many areas though, obviously, that, that could use that sort of assistance. You know, what changes can you make in the current system to, to get greater involvement? Well, governments need to certainly uh, be made aware of the importance of investing. I think also the corporate world needs the type of security that is generated through less violence, so they can also try to influence and push. Uh, I think ICSS is helping create uh, awareness around these issues, and I hope they can be a force for the protection of children. You need to start early in these issues. And what would you change if you I could? was kind of smiling when uh, Secretary Rice mentioned that uh, United States, we're, we're the only country in the world that doesn't have a sports minister and with sports is not centralized and that she took the responsibility on herself to set up the ambassador program and I, I know and, and remember Michelle when she became and a couple of the, the other ambassadors but in this country everything is private. Um, I think the, and I've had talks with several sporting organizations, I think that with the professional sports and the big leagues, I think that at some point they'll have to come to the realization that they aren't the proper people to do developmental sports. Although they have the brand, um, they have the money certainly to be able to do it, uh, but they're very protective of their brand and who they share um, the work with and, and, and the rewards of doing the work with. 
that's a big problem. But they do have the money, and I hope that one day they understand that they are not the people who are really going to um, make significant life-saving cha life changes. Sure, they can go in and promote um, football or cricket or rugby um, in the same places that we do, but I don't know if it's, it, it's as sustainable as the types of programs that you can set up and, and uh, Laureus and other organizations can set up. I think when that happens, um, more, more can be done. We, we can do a lot more than they can do. That's is, sustainable. Is it appropriate for government to, to play that role, whether through regulation or incentives, to try to make that happen? Yeah, but you know, government, you know, we have to fight for, for, for money uh, from government agencies and from the, the Congress, you know, with, within the scope of my job as the chairman of the United States Anti-Doping, and it's a difficult task. Um, and government people are thinking about other things. I'm sure that they have departments, as every government does. It does outreach, sports, uh, things of that nature. Um, um, I just think the private industry is better at it. Private foundations and the private industry, private organizations. At doing the practical job, but certainly the government there needs is to recognize the public good element of it yeah. and also generate the incentives mm -hmm. and, and the environments mm -hmm. and particularly the public areas where sports should take place and where mm -hmm. there should be illumination mm -hmm. and, and lighting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tommy, should government look at sport as a vehicle for social change? Uh, some governments, yeah, but then that comes a list of which governments I think are good and which ones I don't. Which sort of in the eye <laughs> of the beholder. Yeah, that could be interesting. Um, I'm not sure government's the best place to do this. I mean, if, if there's one thing we, I could change, it would be recognising how good sport in the widest possible sense, so sport and physical activity, is good at bringing communities together, about educating, about enlightening people. Um, and at the moment, I don't, I think... We all, even when we talk about sport, we all define it in a different way. Most of the time, we think about it being elite sport, as opposed to what the kids, you know, and the, the local park are doing. So, I, I think there's massive opportunity for sport in the wider sense to be recognised in in a different way and, and see the power of change that that it can bring. And also, we we have this huge untapped sort of group of people who have benefited. Okay, I very obviously, and Edwin have very obviously benefited benefited from being an elite athlete, but. There's lots of young people who will benefit from participating in sport, and that's not Absolutely. used in, a, in the most positive way. Yeah. And, and I think we've got this huge untapped potential of elite athletes, whether it's people who've played for a soccer team or a national team, and in terms of how we transition them out, athletes are used as commodities. And I've got no problem whatsoever with every last ounce of athletic ability being wrung out of an athlete when they're competing for a national team. It's what we do with them afterwards and the responsibility the governing body has then to make sure they're well-rounded, developing individuals who go back and help in sport. And, you know, Edwin's done that. There are thousands of athletes who don't either have the opportunity or know how to or, or what to do. And I, I think, you know, if we could use that in a better way, it would spread a much better message of, of the benefits of sport and physical activity. I'd just add that uh, I think government does have a role. It, it has to be a, a careful one. And uh, as you said, there are governments and governments. Uh, uh, so I would say what good governance would be, I think, as Neil said, there's, this is a public good. Mm -hmm. uh, and if government realizes that it's a public good, it's good for the society, it's good for growth, it's good for health, it's good for um, including uh, citizens. Uh, that helps society. If our societies are, we have marginalized groups, that means our societies are not going to do well. Or they're going to be less competitive, they're going to be less capable, they're going to be less researched, there's going to be less thinking, there's going to be... Uh, more health problems. This, it's a public good. Uh, what I would see is, what I've seen sometimes in, in Greece, I was also Minister of Education, and I've, I've seen that uh, often we have a professionalization of, of sport where it begins very, at a very young age. So rather than a rounded character of, you know, really people uh, uh, seeing sport as, you know, something as we put into our daily life, it's I'm going to get in there because I want to go up that ladder and maybe I'm going to be a superstar at some point like that. And that, that is a very different type of, uh, of, of, of approach. So if government, government could help, and I remember what I tried to do in, in Greece, which uh, we didn't really have much of a culture of inter-school uh, sports. 
it wasn't like, because uh, I've also been in high school in the United States where, you know, you, it's, it's a great thing just to go watch a basketball game or watch a football game, you know, in your, in your, in your region, you know, and who's going to win and the cheerleaders and all that. Uh, it's, 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 it's an amazing spirit. So I was saying, well, what, let's create that spirit rather than having people sort of individually trying to go into their uh, professional league of, you know, Panathinaikos or Olympiakos or so on for soccer and so on. Um, and that, that can change things. So I think government does have a role of making sure that this is a public good. Now, again, there are good and bad governments so I, I, and, and, or bad governance practices, but I think we can, we can define what good governments would be for sport. Nils, a lot of sports fans uh, have no desire to take part in a conversation like this. I want to see my team, my country, I want to be entertained, and that's it. For those who are socially conscious, how do they know what is an effort that's worth supporting and what isn't? Well, uh, Special Olympics, besides engaging five million athletes, engages hundreds and hundreds of thousands of volunteers mm -hmm. who help move mm -hmm. this. And you know, when they can connect with this person that sees in this coach that's helping him, somebody that's spending time with him, when he can see, you know, those eyes sparkle, that volunteer will go back and have a whole week filled with joy because of what he saw in the eyes of, of those athletes. And we need more of that because in life, the priceless things are those that we live for. Mm? Love, joy, care, empathy, and we need much more of that. And sport can be a catalyst, and certainly Special Olympics is part of that. Mm -hmm. So the same, same question, if I'm a sports consumer who, who has a social conscience, how do I know where, where to put my money, to put my interest? Well, I think that uh, here in the United States, for example, I think that most people understand that there is a lot of good to be had from sports, from kids' participation, and, and also, because we're the only country in the world that has like NCAA, uh, uh, high school scholastic athletics, where kids in high school compete in basketball, football, doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And we, we spoke about this at breakfast, how I think England would, would uh, benefit, uh, Britain would benefit from having universities or high school leagues and start. We're the only country in the world where kids can um, be marginal in academics and be great in sports and get a full education and uh, learn all the positive attributes and live all the positive attributes of having a good coach being in an academic environment, uh, learning how to play fair, all those positive things. So I think that people here in the United States innately understand that and they see it on a day-to-day -day basis because you know the, the, the kids' soccer through high school, through college, we know here in this country that there is a great contribution from sports and we're willing to acknowledge that. Um, and the actual question was, <laughs> <laughs> what, what is, what is the answer it? stands on its own. That's all right. What, what is but, but, but how does a sports consumer know what efforts to support? You know, what, what's, a, what's a worthwhile endeavor? How do, you, how do you recognize it? I mean, Nils talked about it. Uh, it's very clear with the Special Olympics how much it re relies on volunteers. Very immediate, tangible uh, re results from it. Uh, you know, a, a few people are going to say, no, no, it's not worth putting your money into that. But if you're looking to make social change, how do you know what's a worthwhile effort? You kind of have to do your research on that. You have to really understand and, and know what type, of, what type of outcomes you want to see. If you're a corporate sponsor or someone who wants to contribute or, or support, I think the parents know that they want their kids to get a positive outcome from sports. So they, um, they will participate and spend their money to help a, a group of kids or a club or a league to, to have those positive outcomes. Corporations, governments, I think it has to be research and you have to really want to know what it is that you expect uh, and what you're, what you're investing in and what you expect, uh, what kind of uh, outcomes you want to have. Tell me what are some of the efforts you've seen globally that you think are effective and really have made a difference besides, I mean, we talked about the Paralympics obviously, but. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, just following on slightly from what Edwin said, is, you know, you're, you're choosing your team that you support at a local level. Happens when you're like two and three years old. You know, I, I 
didn't have any choice in what rugby team I supported growing up in Wales because I supported the team my mother told me I should support because that's the kit she bought me, that's the bobble hat she bought me, beanie, I don't know what you call them over here, that's the scarf. Um, and then, you know, it, it's, it's changed so much in terms of there will always be people who only care how that team does. They don't care who sponsors them, where the kit's made, who makes the kit, how old the person is who's making the kit or what working conditions they're under. But there will be people who do care. And I think, you know, where you see, uh, I'm right to say it's Barcelona, you know, has UNICEF as sponsors. Mm -hmm. You know, there will be clubs who will do, is it yeah, Barcelona? Sorry, yeah. I'm not a soccer fan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, sorry, uh, you know, that, that will start to spread the message out. And, you know, I think parents are more and more aware of the decisions that, that they take and how it affects their children. So the things I've seen, you know, are, um, are things that have been very positive. Company, oh, sorry, sports organisations that have stepped away from sponsors because they've said there isn't the right fit for us anymore. It's, it's not where we want to be. It's not where we want to go. It's really hard for a club or an organisation to turn down money but I think there'll be question more and more about it in the future that you can't just take the money and not care about the responsibility that, that comes with that. So it's, it's pretty tough. But un unless we have, you know, the people who will only ever care about how their team is done, unless we have the people who care who just, again, slowly change attitudes, it, 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 again, it'll take time, but it, but it will happen. We only, we're really at the end of our time, so this will be our last question, unfortunately. But have you seen a, a shift over the years, are we moving, you know, toward greater social responsibility from corporations? Uh, is 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 there a trajectory, uh, essentially, with this issue? I think we're in a time where there's a, you know, it's you've got both trends. I think you have corporations which are becoming bigger, stronger, m more influential, but at the same time, you also have a public opinion, uh, and particularly a younger generation which is savvy very savvy with the internet and, and, and all the social media and so on, that are, are they're demanding certain values to be uh, uh, social, social responsibility, corporate responsibility, um, social responsibility and so on. So there is, I think this is a, you know, in our, in our societies, these are, these are uh, debates, these are conflicts in, 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 in a hopefully very peaceful conflicts, but uh, uh, the, um, I think it, it is it is uh, it is a fight in a sense that we need to to uh, to make people aware, uh, as as Bernice was saying, uh, you can have uh, people that will be so fanatical for their own team they don't care what that team does and where they get their money and as long as they you know they they win or they or they have a possibility of winning, but you have a wider public opinion which uh, uh, is starting to say well let's see is that the kind of model of society we want? Do we have the, the, the fan that's going to be almost violent, you know, do we want to, can't we go to the, the you know, the, the stadium and as, as a family with our kids and not be afraid? These are types of issues which I think will, will come up more and more. And I think one thing which government has to, to, to come down is cer certain rules and regulations, but particularly transparency, as open as possible so that people can know and do the research what Edwin, Edwin is talking about, know what, what, you know, different teams are doing and what different, different organizations are doing. And they'll, they'll, you know, they'll vote with their, their tickets, they'll vote with their, uh, their social media, they'll, uh, and, and, and uh, they, will, they, will, they will make a difference, hopefully. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks to all of you, and Thank especially you. our panel. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.